for the streaming. So I will just need to add that um, to the meetup. So I can share my screen as I do that, I suppose. Okay, that's you, wait. Okay, so. One minute. Multitasking with teenage kids is insanely difficult. Are you, are you talking about me or someone else? <laughs> I'm talking about me. <laughs> no, I mean the kids. The kids, no. I have two teenage kids um, okay. in, in online classes. And uh, these days it's still kind of insane. So let me see, manage. I should be able to edit this thing. I've done this like a million times. It's the, it's all the pressure. <laughs> I should just, uh, I should just put this, uh, as a comment, maybe? Yes. There, I think that should work. Only people read comments. Um, should be able to edit this thing. Don't know why. Anyway, um, okay, so sorry, give me one more minute, <laughs> I swear. Nick, while we're hey. waiting. Can sure. I ask you a quick question about one of your books? Yeah, sure. Uh, about designing autonomous teams and services. Oh, yeah, sure. Is there any way of getting it other than signing up to O'Reilly's Safari? Because I haven't actually found a place I can buy it from yet. Uh, no, it's a free book. It's, uh, it's okay. a short 80-page book. But you have to be on to O'Reilly to read it. Um, I thought it was a free book you could download. Okay. You can, I, think you just... can put, I think you can just put um your email into uh, a text box and get the book to download i think oh, okay i'll have a go if you don't want to use your own email you can use indu's email if you message me i'll <laughs> give it to you after the call <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that is so kind of you nick okay so i think we can get started i don't want to keep uh everyone waiting so let me uh just uh quickly share my screen um basically um can you all see my screen yeah i can see it okay cool so uh hey everyone Welcome to DDD SoCal. We can officially kick start it now that I've figured out all the Zoom issues and install issues on my kid's laptop and uh, she can do her online school. Um, so I run DDD SoCal. Uh, DDD stands for Domain Driven Design for those of you who don't know it. Um, it's based off of Eric Evans book. Um, and Afterman software has been a huge, huge uh, help uh, in trying to help me kickstart this meetup. When I started this meetup, there weren't any meetups for DDD um, in Southern California. That's what I found out. So first it was DDD Irvine, and then people started asking me, hey, is there anything in LA? And so I just decided to call it DDD SoCal. And, and I used to try to shuttle between cities once a month. But with COVID, with everything being online, which makes 
which makes it much easier, I suppose, to do this from my house <laughs> and uh, get people like Nick from all the way from across the world. So, um, so me, I work as an architect uh, in Unisys. Unisys um, helps clients, government, big clients, small clients with their digital transformation journey. I help as an architect try to reduce our clients' business friction and see how uh, we can modernize their legacy applications. So that's sort of my role. I want to talk a little bit about Afterman software. Um, they've been hugely helpful. Uh, they are uh, their team of soft software architects skilled in uh, event-driven architecture and domain-driven design principles. And so what they do is they help clients build their, uh, you know, build uh, build software. So if you um, want, if you're interested um, to talk to them, you can email sales at afterman.software. And I think if you email swag at aftermansoftware.com, they will, they will also send you swag. So uh, you can take them up. And Jason from Afterman Software kindly set up the, the YouTube stream for, because my Zoom account only supports like 100 people. And uh, after that, uh, you know, I don't know. So they set up a YouTube stream for people to be able to at least watch the uh, screen. So um, books on DDD, there's uh, of course Eric's book and Nick's book. I should have put your book, Nick. Um, I did a terrible job. <laughs> uh, it's okay. I don't like my book anymore. Don't buy my book. What? Okay, now now you're gonna have to talk about your book. Um, please do. <laughs> I learned lots of things in the last six years since I wrote that book, and I realized, don't buy that book. Don't buy that book. Are you writing a new one? Um. Well, I'm. I'm. Uh, I decided to write a book on Lean Pub. Okay. Just to keep me busy during lockdown. So okay. we'll see how it goes. Awesome. So you should uh, send us a, a link to your lean bug. So maybe we can support you and get that going. Um, well, actually, I put the price of the book as $200 so that nobody would buy it. <laughs> and then people started messaging me saying, who the hell do you think you are putting your buck at $200? Like, you think you're such a smart guy. So I put the book down to $20 and now loads of people bought it again. So that puts pressure on me to get it done. It was just like a placeholder. So... <laughs> basically you can't please people so you should you should give me the lean pub book and i can include that and post it um after the meetup and uh conferences there's uh two conferences one in the us and uh one one in europe uh, for ddd um explore ddd is the conference in denver um i think this year everything is virtual ddd europe i'm wearing my ddd Europe t-shirt. I don't know if you can see, but um, it's uh, it, it, this year or the coming year is also going to be online with workshops and uh, more hands-on uh, hands labs and uh, workshops mostly this year. Um, I believe their schedule is up. So in the virtual world, you know, take a, take a look at uh, what they offer. Uh, but I have learned a lot through both these conferences about DDD. Um, so without further waiting, here's Nick. Um, he's going to talk to us about finding service boundaries. And I told him to use microservices, the word microservices, um, at least 10 times in this talk. <laughs> so uh, maybe I just need to use it once with added effect. <laughs> Let's see what's lined up. So I'm going to stop my uh, screen and um, make you, I guess, host. Um, so you can you can screen share and um, yeah. take it away. All right. So this this talk isn't a talk about finding service boundaries. I've changed my mind. <laughs> and I thought I would call this talk defining service boundaries with the boundary context canvas because everyone talks about finding boundaries, but this isn't really about finding boundaries. 
So I've just got to set a few things up here and then I'll get started. I've lost my mouse cursor. Is this going to work? Okay, I can change slides. Okay, so it's not about finding service boundaries. It's about what comes next. What about once we found our boundaries, how do we go a bit deeper and verify that we've made some good choices? So I know this is a very interesting topic to everyone. We like to talk about microservices. We like to talk about boundaries. We love talking about how big should a microservice be? Six years, seven years, probably eight or nine years into microservices. The number one question is still, how big should a microservice be? And I think there's a lot more, there are a lot more interesting questions you could be asking, which will give you better feedback on your design than just asking about size. But a question more important than all of those things is, does, do the boundaries even matter? We spend so much time talking about boundaries and size of microservices, does any of this stuff really matter? Well, the answer is, it might matter, and it might actually be one of the most important things you can do. So Nicole Forsgren, Jess Humble, and Gene Kim, they've been doing DevOps surveys for about five, six years now. And a couple of years ago, they, they wrote a book, Accelerate, summarizing their findings. And what they've continued to find each year is that organizations that deploy software more frequently have the highest quality, the highest reliability, one of the biggest predictors of that is a loosely coupled architecture and an organizational structure to match. So that would indicate, yeah, finding service boundaries is important. Then we have to note here as well, it's, it's about the organizational structure. So according to their research, if you only have the architectural boundaries, architectural loose coupling, but you don't have the organizational structure to match, you don't get these benefits or the, the, the predictive capabilities don't confirm you will get those benefits. So if loose coupling is the answer to our delivery problems, aren't microservices about loose coupling? Surely microservices is therefore the answer. And microservices aren't the answer because microservices talk about physical separation but that doesn't guarantee a logical separation. So you can organize your code however you want to. You can put any line of code in any microservice, but if the concepts, if the concepts in your domain, which that code represents is coupled and different parts of that domain concept live in different microservices, then the coupling is still there you now have a network in between and you have the public interface of your microservices, which also have to change when that coupling changes and, and multiple teams involved. So that's why microservices without domain driven design is, is quite dangerous. It's like putting your head into a crocodile's mouth. How many times have I said microservices? Probably four so far. So I've got a few more to go. But this is the point I want to make about microservices. Without domain driven design, it's very dangerous. But even with domain driven design, it's still very dangerous because domain driven design isn't a checkbox where you say, we're going to do domain driven design and we get lots of delivery capabilities out of the box for free. So look at these concepts here. Look at these shapes and colors. Imagine you're modeling a domain you, you identify these domain concepts and you have to organize these into microservices. Where were your boundaries here? How do you organize these concepts into microservices? So there are three obvious ones. We can organize things by shape. We can organize things by color. We could organize things by unique combinations. But if you look at this example and you start thinking outside the box, there are probably another five or 10 choices here. What if we've got a characteristic that isn't represented here, like the size of things? So the point is, even if you choose to do DDD, finding the right boundaries is still very difficult 
And the reason is because when we talk about coupling, we always forget one of the most important points of coupling. One of the most important points of coupling is that concepts can be coupled by different characteristics. As you can see here, things can be coupled by their shape, things can be coupled by their color. And that means there is no one way of organizing things according to coupling. We have different coupling in the system based on different characteristics of the domain. So we need to make choices. And those choices are bets. We are looking at the different characteristics of coupling in the system and we are deciding we're going to organize things which are coupled by this characteristic, shape, color, something else, because we believe that that characteristic will change most frequently and those concepts will change most frequently together. Now, there are two things to consider here. The first one is our bets might be wrong. The things we expect to change together don't change together. So we need to monitor that and be prepared to make changes. The other consideration has just fallen out of my mind, so I can't remember it. I'll have to come back to that one later. What was it now? It was right there, I had it. Oh, I can't remember now. I might use speaker notes in the future. I forgot. Let's move on to the next example. So is tomato a fruit or a vegetable? Are you asking us? You don't need to answer, you can just think about this for a second. So some people like to tease children, try and be clever. Hey kid, is a tomato a fruit or a vegetable? And when the kid says it's a vegetable, you say no, it's a fruit. Tomato is actually a fruit because it has seeds and all this stuff. But actually you might be wrong because in the 1800s, there was a tax in the United States of America you had to pay an import tax on your vegetables, on your fruits, sorry. But people were importing lots of vegetables, uh, lots of tomatoes to get around that. So they reclassified tomatoes as a vegetable. So people would have to pay more tax, even though science, science said tomatoes are a fruit and the United States government said, no, they're now vegetables and you have to pay tax on them. So even when science has a clear definition, the way we think about concepts and define them is, is much more fuzzy, is open to interpretation. And it varies based on the context we're working in. And this is an essential concept from domain driven design. If we want to identify those characteristics of a system which affects coupling, the things that change together, looking at the language used, which words have a consistent meaning in which part of the domain, that is an indicator of things which change together and belong together. And in fact, that's probably the most fundamental concept or heuristic of domain driven design, looking at the domain language as a way to organize our architecture. Something else we need to think about, and this is something that the microservices people don't want you to think about, is balancing local complexity versus global complexity. So a lot of microservices people like to talk about, yeah, you can have lots of microservices, they're 100 lines of code, very simple. And that's very true. Each microservice is very simple because it's 100 lines of code. But the problem is that's only one half of complexity. That's the local complexity. Because each microservice is smaller, you have more microservices and more integration paths between those microservices. So the global complexity of your system is higher if we have smaller, if we have larger services, but fewer of them, the local complexity of each microservice is higher, but the overall global complexity is lower. So there, there is no right or wrong answer here. It might make sense to have some microservices with 100 lines of code, but it shouldn't be a rule that we stick to. We should be thinking about local versus global complexity. On the same note, we should be thinking about social complexity, about the organization of our teams and the size of those teams. If we have lots of small microservices, 
we'll have lots of small teams and more work will cross multiple teams and we'll have more dependencies in the organization. If we have bigger services, we'll have more people inside a team and we'll have more communication path inside a team. Team topologies, um, they looked at some studies and research and, and they found out once you get past nine people in a team, the communication path starts to become excessive, context switching burnout becomes a factor. So whilst, whilst the size of things isn't super important, we do have an upper limit. Once a service becomes too big for nine developers to maintain or a team of nine, that's when we might want to start making it smaller. And ThoughtWorks did some research into this. They looked at a number of their projects and what they found is, and it's quite a staggering insight actually, they found that when a piece, so they term it leading a team. So when a piece of work leaves a team, when multiple teams have to collaborate on a piece of work, it takes an order of magnitude longer to complete that piece of work. So if you have lots of small microservices and lots of small teams, that's lots of orders of magnitude greater to complete a piece of work. So I'm sure if we look deeper into this research, there are caveats and conditions about culture and the way the organization works, but still it's worth keeping in mind when multiple teams have to collaborate, things typically take longer. Something else that's important about looking beyond size is about the value of things. If we couple low value and high value things, we, it takes more effort to improve the high value parts of a system. So if I have the core parts of my business, the key things, you know, if we look at the business roadmap and the business say for the next year, we need to absolutely be awesome in this area, developing this microservice. And that capability is coupled to low value parts of a system we're going to be limited by those bad parts of a system. So an example would be, we've got a code base, which is important, which you want to develop in the next six months. And the good parts of the code base have tests, but the low value parts of the code base don't have tests. Well, we can't deploy that as easily and make changes as easily because there are fewer tests. So the high value parts of the system are slowed down by the low value parts of the system. So when we're thinking about boundaries, we should also think about value. How can we not isolate what's core to the business and iterate that as quickly as possible because the payback from a business perspective is greatest. So my summary to that is, if we think about architectural boundaries as bets, we're choosing from a number of options and to make the appropriate choices, we need to understand the business model and choose which architectural trade-offs, which boundaries are relevant or most appropriate for the business goals we're trying to achieve. So a quick summary of those things, when looking for boundaries, like a short recipe, think about the business model, map out the domain, and importantly, look for options, options which trade off local versus global complexity, team size, other organizational impacts. And then remember, we're placing bets about what we think the future looks like. Remember, it's a bet. It could be wrong. It could turn out to be wrong. We need to monitor those bets and evolve the architecture, evolve our choices. So that's how we get to the bounded context canvas. So this is a tool we've been developing over the past year. And what we try to do with this is we take an individual bounded context, which you can think of as a microservice, although that's another conversation. And what we try to do is capture all of this information in one place so we can analyze the bet we're making. So we capture information about the business model. We map out the interface, the messages, the dependencies with other contexts. We're looking at the, the global complexity there. We look at the internals. We look at the decisions made inside the context. We look at the role this bounded context has, give an indicator of how complex is it on the inside. And then we capture the language, the key domain terminology, which we think is important and helps us to identify words that have a different meanings in different places. 
So you, you won't understand all of this canvas yet, so don't worry. I want to just highlight a few of the benefits you can get from visualizing all of this information in one place. So if we start with the description, if we're talking about technical details here, we're not focused on the, the, the architectural benefits and the business value of this context or its functionality in the domain, that might indicate you're thinking too much about technical things. If we're saying something's core to the business, but also generic, I'll explain these terms later, but this indicates we probably don't understand the business value of this thing, or we've coupled bit different concepts. If we look in the top right-hand corner and we see that this context is doing multiple different roles, and I'll explain what those things mean later too, probably doing too much on the inside, might be a bit too big. We can look at the messages and we can see that this is a context about business tax and we've got a message about adding credit cards. That probably doesn't belong here, but sometimes you don't notice these things. Seeing one problem and worrying, we're seeing the whole picture and we can assess those bets more clearly and objectively. So before I talk more about the canvas itself, I'm going to just talk about the process you can use to get the information to put on your canvas. And I want to quickly try and rearrange my screen, but my cursor is invisible, so I might not be able to. All right, cool. Thank you for that. So over the, um, I think during the course of this year, during lockdown, we've tried to create a process for people who are new to domain driven design to help them see how all of these concepts fit together, to see how the different techniques and tools of domain driven design fit together, and to see how you can use them to form the basis of a design process. So we've created this modeling process. It's on GitHub, it's Creative Commons. We've accepted pull requests before. We're always open to pull requests. It's a community tool and no one's profiting from this. Do have an important caveat. And what we're, what we're not trying to say with this tool is that this is some kind of big upfront process. It's not a waterfall process. You don't go through each of these eight steps once and you're done. We're not saying because coding comes last, it's not important. Coding is still very important. What we should look at this process as is the first iteration of our architecture. We should go through this process many times when designing a system. And we might not even go through the process in this order. However, if you're new to DDD, if you're not sure where to start, I believe it's a great starting point to get you seeing the, seeing the basics, seeing the tools, how they fit together. And once you've done it once or twice, you can throw the process away and use it however you need to. So step one, we talk about aligning to the business model. That can be very daunting if you're not familiar with business models, but the business model canvas is an approachable tool, helps you to map out a business model and actually I based a bounded context canvas on, on the business model canvas. So this can be a starting point. This gives you the focus. What's important to this company? Which customer segments are we targeting? And what are the key activities? What things do we need to do well as a company in order to provide our customer segments with the value propositions? We can also look at the cost structure and the revenue streams. And with this information, with this information about how the business works, we've got a clear reference point for our architecture. When we're making those bets, we look at the business model and work out which bets in our architecture are most likely to achieve the goals we have for this business model. Once we have a clear picture of the business model, we can start mapping out the domain. So the, the most popular technique at the moment is event storming. Event storming is a collaborative tool. We get lots of people together. We make a mess with post-its, but importantly, we get deep into the design of our domain. We go beyond high level superficial details 
and we really get into the guts of the domain and we can explore in as much detail as needed, we can get domain experts, we can get developers together. And this helps us to see the real complexity in the domain. When we talked earlier about the characteristics of coupling, sometimes you look at a domain, you might look at a company's website and you might think, oh, there are some clear boundaries in this domain. But once you get into event storming and you start going through concrete use cases, you've got domain experts with you, suddenly all of these edge cases and requirements start popping up that you hadn't thought of before. And that can change your whole perspective about how to design the boundaries of an architecture. Event storming is actually a useful tool for mapping out a first cut of our boundaries, of our bounded context or microservices. So there are a number of techniques. Um, in this diagram here, you can see a concept called pivotal events. You can also see these arbitrary groupings. And that's kind of how it goes with event storming. It's not a structured technique, it's not BPM. It is quite fuzzy. And that's the benefit. We can have these fuzzy conversations. We can ask questions to domain experts. We can zoom in where things don't make sense. We can explore more use cases and we can really get those characteristics of coupling that just aren't visible when you stay at a superficial level. In terms of putting those boundaries on the event storm, there are a number of heuristics you can use there. And as, as we've talked about earlier, the key things from earlier, first one is about value. So ask the business, how do we make money? What makes us different? Start by isolating those things, the most important parts of the system. Try and minimize those contexts and isolate exactly which parts give you the value. Then start to look for some domain heuristics. Start to look for events in your event storm where the same word is coming up multiple times, like an order or a customer or a tomato and ask the domain expert. What are the rules that apply to this concept here? How would you describe the role of this concept in this part of the domain? And look for where the definition is different. And then think about teams. So if you're working in an existing domain, think about the existing organizational structure. Think about how, how many teams, how many people would be involved if you were to make it a bounded context. So you create your bounded context on the event storm, you put a a boundary around some events and then talk to the domain experts. What does the roadmap look like for these concepts? How many people do we need working on that concept over the next 6, 12, 24 months to achieve the goals? And if the number's like 20 people, it's probably too big to be a single context. We also have the face reality. Sometimes you have tech, um, legacy systems, legacy context, technical debts, and that those constraints aren't easy to change. That can affect our boundaries too. We can absolutely make that clear on an event storm where we have the legacy coupling. And it's also important to think about the user experience. People often ask about what's the difference between a user journey and a bounded context. And we also have people talk. One of the problems I see is people find these superficial boundaries in their domain and they stop there. Yeah, we'll have a sales context or a billing context, but that, that might not be the right solution here. Sales could be a big context. It, it might not be the right context. What we're lacking to make that choice is the coupling. So what we talked about at the start of this talk and the Accelerate book found, it's the loose coupling that matters. So if you only have the boundaries, the boundaries alone do not show you the coupling. So what we need to do is apply real use cases to our model of our boundaries and see the messages flowing between the bounded contexts. This is our coupling. 
It's the coupling in the software, but also the dependencies between the bound of context are coupling in the organization. So Eric Evans has this. So the technique I recommend here is just a simple tool called message flow modeling. So you map out your bounded context, you choose a scenario, you map out your bounded contexts, and you show the messages flowing between them. And you would create um, many of these message flows for different scenarios. And what you're doing is what Eric Evans calls the model exploration whirlpool. So we, we create our initial set of boundaries. That's our initial bets. We think these are the right boundaries. We then apply concrete use cases by mapping out the message flows. So placing an order, business customer placing an order, refunding an order. We go through all of these different scenarios and we build up a picture of the coupling in the system. And as we get more feedback, as we can visualize the coupling more, we can start to realize, oh, this context is way too big. This one is way too small. This one is, has just too many dependencies. This one has no dependencies. Maybe it should be just combined into this other bound of context. But if you don't visualize the message flows and the integrations, you can't see the coupling. So that's why focusing just on the boundaries will lead you to probably, you'll get, if, you're about, if your architecture is right, you'll be lucky, but most likely you'll have coupling, which is gonna cause you problems because you haven't visualized it in advance. So the next thing we want to talk about is isolating the core. So this goes back to the business model. How do we know that the boundaries we've chosen on the event storm or however else we've done that, how do we know we've isolated what's core to the business? So what we can do is we can start to map out our core domains and our supporting domains and our generic domains using a tool like the core domain chart. So across the x-axis, we plot how important is this to the business? How much of an advantage can we get over our competitors if we do this microservice better than other companies in this space develop their microservice? We then talk about the complexity of that bounded context. How difficult is it to build this bounded context? Complexity is not always a bad thing because the more complex something is, the difficult, the, the more challenging, the more difficult it is for your competitors to copy you. So choosing something complex is not a bad thing. It indicates a defensible advantage. So when we map out all of our contexts in this way, we might look at the generic things and say, let's outsource those and let's focus on our core domains. We can also see what's supporting to the business. So supporting means it's necessary to help us deliver our core domains, but we don't, we, we can't get an advantage from our support and contexts. So we need to remember, let's not over-engineer them. Let's not put too many people on those things. Let's always think about the core. And as we're doing this, we might, we might see that the boundaries are again wrong here. We might have trouble indicating, is it core? Is it supporting? Is it generic? If you're having that kind of conversation, your boundary context might be doing multiple things, some of it's generic and some of it's core. And that could be a good reason to, again, refine your boundaries at this point. What we also need to think about is how the domain will change over time. So as I was talking about previously, if we have a core domain with high business differentiation, but the complexity is low, we should be thinking to ourselves here, the complexity is low, our competitors will probably be able to copy this idea this thing won't be the core domain in six or 12 months. What's the next core domain? So even though something's the core domain, we don't necessarily want to focus all of our effort and energy on that because in the future it won't be. When it comes to the organizational structure, thinking about the effects on the teams, there was an interesting book released, I think it was last year called Team Topologies. I highly recommend this book. There's a lot of stuff in this book. I'm not gonna talk about all of that stuff. Now, what I want to pick out here 
is the types of collaboration and why this is important to your architecture and the structure of your teams. So very briefly, collaboration is where two teams are working together on a shared goal. So they might be developing a new feature, which requires changes to multiple bound of context. X as a service is where one team provides some functionality, maybe as an API, but the teams using that API don't need to collaborate. They might just read the documentation and that's it. Facilitating is basically where one team helps another. Maybe some people go and work from one team and temporarily work in another team. So we can then start to map out these organizational dynamics against our boundaries, visualizing what's core to our business. And we can see things like if we have a core domain and the core domain is collaborating with four other teams, we know that collaboration is a high cost. It's teams working together, shared meetings. And that's a warning sign to us. Wow. If our core domain is collaborating so much, they're probably not getting anything done. Maybe that's a warning sign about the boundaries. It could be fine. It's just a warning sign that if we have so many dependencies on the core in terms of the organizational dependencies, that might be a reason to rethink the boundaries. What we can also do here is to show the size of each team, the number of people working in each team. And what we can see in this example is we've got more people working on our supporting than our core domains. That's another potential problem to look at here. In this particular example, the supporting domains are high complex because we've added lots of accidental complexity. So by reducing the complexity there, we can put more people in the core domain. So I'm going to take a quick breather and then I'll talk to you about the Bounding Context Canvas. All right, so how do you get value from your Bounded Context Canvas? So let's look at the names. <laughs> so the first thing, the first rule is generic names attract generic behavior. If you see a word like management, that's not very prescriptive about what's in or what's outside of that. Anything related to business property tax could be thrown in this bounded context if we call it management. What we can do instead is to name it something more specifically. So business property tax register. So if you work in this domain, you know what that word means and you know like, oh, someone trying to reduce their tax, that doesn't belong here, that's not part of the register. But with management, it could belong there because it's a more generic word. So the precision of a name sets the whole context of what we're designing. So then we get to the description. So you might think a description is just a filler, a placeholder on the canvas just to take up some space to make it look nice with three boxes and stuff. It's really not. Whenever I do this, I always see people arguing or not necessarily arguing, but having interesting conversations about the description because when you're forced to take an idea from your head and put it in writing, that's when you realize you disagree with other people. You have to be more precise in, in writing. And when you write things down, you evaluate them more concretely. So I've seen happening when people write the description down of a bounded context. They use the word and, it does this and this and this. And the word and is com combines things, it combines this and this. So that's already a trigger sign, is this doing too much? It doesn't mean it's doing too much, but it's just an indicator already that our design might be too big. So a description can be useful, but it has to be done properly. So don't put the implementation details in here do imagine it's an elevator pitch for someone who's not building the system. Imagine you're in an elevator with the CEO or someone from management and you're trying to explain to them what that thing does you're working on and why it's important to the business. Or imagine you want funding for this bounded context. Why should someone invest in this? What's the business value and why is it important? 
We then get to the strategic classification. So there are three things to look at here. And you, you don't have to use these three things. If you want to put other information on here about how you classify the value of your architecture, that's also fine. So the first one is about the domain. Is it core supporting or generic? Second one's about the business model. What function does this founded context provide in the business model? What's its role in the business model? So your architecture implements pro business processes that enable your business model to succeed or be successful. So therefore, your, each component in your architecture plays a role in fulfilling your company's business model. So in here, we want to capture what that role is. And then evolution, I'll explain that shortly. So in terms of business model roles, if we think about a search company like Google, so they don't make any money from their search engine. The functionality there's more about acquiring customers or engaging them, providing a feature that they come back and use. Advertising is how they make money, that's their revenue. And GDPR is, is compliant, it's a necessity for the business model. So you might be wondering which of these is the core domain? People always think it's the revenue or oh, how we make money is the core domain, but that's not always true. What makes you different? That's the core domain. Would anyone use Google search if the search was terrible? No, they wouldn't. So the search might be more important than the ads that generate the revenue. So this diagram is probably going to be very confusing if you haven't done worldly mapping before. I've done Wardley mapping before, and it's still very confusing to me. There's lots of stuff going on here. So don't worry about this diagram. But the point is, Wardley mapping is about visualizing how your business ecosystem or how your domain is going to evolve over time. Basically, every concept in your business starts out as a new idea. It's new, it's interesting. There's lots of opportunity here. But over a period of time, it becomes boring, becomes the old technology, and it's not exciting anymore. So as architects, you should always be thinking, how is this domain evolving? What's the core domain now? And what's the core domain in the future? And this Wardley map helps you to identify what will be the core in the future. I've got lots to say about Wardley mapping, but I'm not going to talk about it anymore today. Um, there, were, there were some great resources out there. Uh, Wardley himself, he wrote a free book on Wardley mapping. I recommend starting there. Um, I've also done some meetups on Wardley mapping. So if you go to virtual domain driven design, there's a video you can watch. We, we did that meetup just after um, COVID breakout and lockdown. I had a very COVID focus on it. Did some social distancing. So then we think about the interface of a bounded context. What is the interface of a bounded context or even a microservice? So it has messages coming in and it has messages going out and we try not to share databases. So this is it. We're trying to visualize who is sending us messages and what are the messages we send to others. So we can visualize this on the canvas we have, the, we have the context in the middle and we have the messages coming in and going out on either side. Now, one of the key things I want to highlight here is that we use the word message in the general sense. It doesn't imply a message bus. It doesn't imply any technology. In fact, you can think about object-oriented programming. When you call a method on an object, you're sending it a message in abstract general terms. And that's what we're saying here. What comes in? So what are the commands coming in here? A command is an instruction from another context telling us what to do. An event is a notification that something happened. And a query is a request for information. So these can be implemented in many ways. If you think about it in a general sense, submitting a form on a website is you issuing a command to the website. Add this thing to my basket. So when we, when we map out all of the messages in a bounded context interface, 
we can start to look at the overall design and identify opportunities for improvement or actually bad design decisions which start to stand out. So we can look at the names. Are all of the names on the messages coherent and consistent with each other? What about the types of messages? What if we flip a command for an event? How does that change the design? How does that impact the coupling? We can also see the size of the interface. If we've got 100 messages coming in and 100 messages going out, that's probably doing too many things, almost certainly doing too many things. I think the size of the interface is a much bigger predictor of a bounded context being too big than the number of lines of code inside. We can also start to visualize encapsulation here. If we're exposing a lot of messages, we're exposing a lot of the internals of the bounded context. And the more we expose, the harder it is to change later. Anything we make public is a contract. And once somebody depends on what we expose publicly, we can't change or refactor that easily because we've got dependencies. So we start getting into versioning and organizational politics when teams are too busy to switch to new versions. So looking at the interface, spending some time up front, thinking about, are we happy to expose this? Are we happy to, be, to allow others to be coupled to this? Can save a lot of time in the long run. And we can also start playing around with messages. What if we move this command from this context to this context? How does that impact the design? So we're visualizing the puzzle and we can move the pieces around and see what fits best. But if we don't visualize it, we don't give ourselves these choices. What we can also do on the canvas is we can start to visualize the collaborators. So who is sending us messages and who are we sending messages to? Does it make sense that the website is asking us to add a credit card to our accounts when we're a property tax register? No, it doesn't. And those things stand out very clearly when you do this. Uh, someone tweeted, I think it was end of last week, I did the bounded context canvas for my, I did the first bounded context canvas in my company and oh my God, what were we thinking? So sometimes you have these bad design choices, you just can't see them. And what we're doing here is visualizing coupling that we weren't aware of before. So we can show different kinds of collaborators, which other bounded contexts, which external systems, which front ends and mobile apps. And sometimes we have users talking directly to our bounded context. You might be using micro front ends or having some other interface which the bounded context owns. Again, we can look at the design holistically when we visualize everything, we can start asking questions. Do we have too many dependencies? We might not have hundreds of messages. We might have 10 or 20 messages, but each of those messages is only consumed by one collaborator and we have 20 collaborators. If we think about that from the organizational perspective, that's one team potentially they have a dependency on 20 other teams or 20 other teams depend on us. So what we can do is we can start to challenge those dependencies. What if we didn't depend on this other context for this message? How else would we get the data? For example, we can start playing, we can start exploring the options here, challenging our bets. We can also look at chattiness as an indicator. If two bounded contexts are exchanging lots of messages, maybe either they belong together or bits of one context and bits of another context should be pulled out into a third context. So we can see these patterns and we can explore options to reduce the coupling. Another big topic in domain driven design is context mapping. And this, looks at, this also looks at the relationship between bound contexts, but from a different perspective. This is about how changes or choices in one context impact another. For example, if we have the conformist pattern, that means one bounded context is, having the, is adopting the domain model of another context. And therefore, when the first context changes its domain model, the downstream context also has to change because it's coupled to the schema. Think of the coupling to the schema. We can also visualize the way teams interact. And there's some overlap with team topologies here. 
So a partnership is where two teams are working together towards shared goals. Whereas a customer supplier is where one team holds some authority over the other. And it's more of a one-way relationship with less influence. So we can also visualize these relationships on the canvas and we can start to spot problems like, oh, in this context, we have a partnership with five other contexts. Now we know a partnership is a collaboration which has a high cost, high attention cost. It's shared meetings between multiple teams. So we might rethink our boundaries here. If one team is partnered with five others, it's a lot of collaboration and not much getting any work done. How can we change this context to reduce that coupling? Or maybe we're happy with it. Maybe we realize there's more coupling here than we realized, and we need to manage that in the organization a better way. So we're just making it visible, and then we can explore the options. So business decisions. This talks about the business rules and the policies inside your context. We want to visualize this for a couple of reasons. It shows us why the context is important. We can see where important decisions in the software are made. We can also start to ask, this bounded context makes certain decisions or a certain decision. How does it get the information it needs to make that decision? We might look at the interface and realize, oh, to make this decision, we need the user's history of purchases, but we don't have that. Oh, we've got missing coupling here. We need to work out how to get that information in here to make the decision. When we make decisions, there might be other parts of the system that care about the outcome. So we can ask, who cares about this decision? Are there any contacts in our outgoing communication which aren't listed here that care about this decision? If so, we've got more hidden coupling we hadn't realized before. We also have different kinds of decision. Typically, broadly speaking, there are two kinds. There's an invariant, which is a strict rule. This is something that can never be violated. So in the system, I'll come to an example after, we also have a rule that can be applied retrospectively, which we can't always enforce strictly. That's more of a compensating action or compensating policy. So a couple of examples. So an invariant could be that usernames can never be unique. It's not acceptable under any circumstances for the system to have two usernames assigned to different users. Never, ever. It can never be in that state. We might have a business rule that says a bank balance cannot ever be negative. However, we can't always enforce this rule. You know, a user might have $1 in their bank account and the bank might receive two transactions for $1 from different shops. The user might place two orders at the same time and the system might not realize. So it approves the two transactions and the bank goes below zero, even though that should never happen. So what we have to do in this situation is to compensate, to retrospectively fix that. We send the user an email or a notification, hey, your bank balance is below zero. If you don't fix this in 10 days, we'll start charging you some crazy amount of interest. So when we make these decisions visible, we can start to analyze, are these decisions invariants or are there compensating policies we can't always enforce? And that helps us to see more local complexity and also maybe global complexity. Maybe in order to resolve an action, we've got another hidden dependency we hadn't seen before. We then have the ubiquitous language section. And this has a number of benefits. Firstly, we can make a point. What's the key language in here? For everyone working on this project, what are the key domain terms we need to make clear? We can also start to explore how do the words in this context, what does business tax mean in this context versus in another context over here? Are the definitions different? We can make that visible. We can put multiple canvases next to each other and we can show people in this context, this word means one thing. But over here, a tomato is something else because we're doing cooking over here. We don't care about science. Then you can start finding some interesting um, patterns in your language. So one pattern is duplicate, con duplicate concepts. 
do we have two words that mean the same thing? In almost every domain I've worked in, there's always been multiple ways to explain a concept. Sometimes we have an internal word, and sometimes we, in our marketing or our user interface, we use simpler terms for the user. In here, we can make that distinction. Here's the internal name we use, and here's the same word we give to the users to describe the same concept. We can also look for false cognates, which is the opposite. And these are terms that Eric came up with in his book, by the way. So false cognates is when we have two things that look the same, but they're not the same. And these can be very dangerous on projects too. So we can make those clear here. The final section of the canvas is domain roles. And this can be very confusing to some people. And it probably is because we haven't fully figured it out yet. So here's an example from Alberto Brandolini. He talks about three different kinds of bounded contexts. So some bounded contexts are all about creating some draft or specification. We, we build up a description of something we want to happen. It could be adding items to your shopping basket. We're just describing or we're, we, can, we can add and remove items. We haven't made a choice yet. But once we place the order, we create the specification and we hand it over to an execution context, which is responsible for ensuring that the order process gets completed. We also have analyze contexts or audit contexts. These contexts are, char are characterized by receiving lots of data and generating new insights or making decisions or keeping an audit log of things that have happened. So when we see a bounded context, which does all three of these things, we can start to see that maybe it's doing too much. Three different kinds of domain models all inside the same bounded context. So these aren't the only roles. These are just three good examples. If you look in this slide, there's a link to GitHub where you can see a, a list of more. It's called the model traits worksheet here because we used to call this model traits, but people always used to say, what does model traits mean? Now, even though I explained it every day of my life for six months, people still don't understand it. Someone said, I keep thinking of model treats. What's a model treat? I'm like, oh. How can I find a simple way of explaining this? So I realized domain roles was a better answer. And this goes back to Rebecca Versbrock's book about um, object design. She talks about roles and responsibilities in object-oriented code. And the same kind of concepts apply here at an architectural level. So by identifying these different roles, we can start to identify different responsibilities. So that's basically it for this talk. I'm just gonna talk you through a few final details and then I'm gonna be available for any questions if we still have time. So the key point I wanted to make here, even if you don't use the canvas, is to collect the important information about the design of your architecture and make it visible. When you make things visible, you can start to see connections, good connections and bad connections. Things stand out. Why, why does that message belong in this context? It doesn't have any connection to anything else in the context. Why is this our core domain when it doesn't have any dependencies? Does that make sense? We, we start to see these patterns and we can make more informed choices. The bounded context canvas itself can be used as an aspirational tool about future designs you think could make sense but it can also be used as an informational tool to describe what's there now. And I think it's very important to be clear that when you're using it, which of these purposes are you using it for? That's when things can get a bit confusing, when people aren't sure what it represents. So maybe we should improve the canvas actually and add some kind of icon. Is it aspirational or informational? Let me know what you think anyway. If you use it, if you have any ideas, always open to improving it. If you want to use the canvas, there's a free template on Miro. Um, I created this a while ago. Um, it's all free. Uh, you can sign up for Miro for free. The template's completely free. You shouldn't have to pay for this in any way. You only start paying once you have like five Miro boards. So if you use it and you like it, fantastic. If you use it and you don't like it, 
please let me know if, you, if there's anything I can improve. Always happy to improve it. And also, something I think is super interesting, and I think this is the future of architecture. So this company called Software Park, they're building a tool called Contexture, which is a way of automating your bounded context canvas. So just imagine this, right? Imagine you could go to any software system and you could say, create a bounded context canvas for all of the microservices or bounded context in the architecture. How awesome would that be? You could learn a new system very quickly. How long does it take you to learn a new code base right now? Six months? How long does it take you to learn the entire architecture of your company? Probably never. Imagine if all of that information was available in a tool and you could just visualize it. So I think this is the future and they're working on a first version of this tool where you can automate your bounded context. I think at the moment you have to manually type in the information, but they're working on connections and adapters where it can look at your code base and extract the messages coming in and going out. So I think that's exciting and, and they're taking this tool much further than just the canvas. It's, it's a tool for mapping out your architecture and your domain. And I think there's lots of potential here. I think the complexity of systems is so high and they're so difficult to learn that tools like this are the future. So if you have any questions which you don't want to ask today or you think of in the future, you can always ask a question on the GitHub, just raise an issue. Um, any questions are welcome. Simple, newcomer, advanced, expert. We don't mind, it's all good. And that is it for me. That's the end of this talk. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for taking your time. And I know you've had a, a long day with your workshop and 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 this. So I, I really, really appreciate appreciate you taking your time and, and sharing your knowledge with uh, all of us. I believe we have about uh, 10 minutes for questions. Um, there's one question here on the chat. Are you getting paid as an influencer by Miro now that, or have they still not jumped at the opportunity? <laughs> there are some conversations going on, but I can't reveal the full details. Okay. Let's just say it will come out in the media one day. The full story will come out. Cool. Um, there's another question from Praveen. Um, who all should be part of Sprint Zero? Well, that's an interesting question. I think the, the entire concept of Sprint Zero is a bit controversial. Um, I guess, um, what's the definition of Sprint Zero here? Are we talking about two weeks design phase before the actual work, or are we talking about more upfront planning? Praveen, can you answer that? You can unmute yourself. Design phase. So consider Sprint Zero to be design phase. Yeah, okay. I think it depends on many factors. So when I worked in the UK government, for example, they made it a process for every, every company in the UK, every team in the UK government, you have to form a cross-functional team. You have to do certain kinds of discovery work. So technical discovery, domain discovery, talking to your customer discovery. So I think that's a good starting point. So talking to users, doing some technical discussions, investigations, and then for the domain. So I'm obviously a big fan of event storming and with event storming, we try and get, we try and get the people in an event storm who have the information we think is important and the people who need to ask questions. So that can be a whole mix of UX, products, management, developers, testers. We, we kind of have to look at the project and make a decision about who we think is best to have in those meetings. And it could be that we have multiple event stormings on different occasions and we invite different people to different event storming sessions. So I don't have a cu cookie cutter rule, but I, I would say as a sensible default, UX, product, technical, at least, I would say. Cool. Um, 
The term bounded context and microservice are often conflated. It's an entire discussion, but curious if you would, if you could discuss how you can distinguish the two at a higher level. Well, what I think, what I think is interesting is that the, the microservices people are saying that a microservices should be a bounded context, but they're also saying a microservice should be 100 lines of code. And those two things don't really work together because a bounded context can be bigger than 100 lines of code. So with a bounded context, we're looking at the domain, the business model, the organizational structure, and we're trying to work out what's the optimal size here. What, what coupling are we happy with? Which things need to be locally coupled and which things are coupled via a public interface? And so I don't really want to speak on behalf of the microservices people because I feel that I'm not clear what their definition is. So all I would say is that a bounded context is a logical boundary. If you wanted to, you could break your bounded context up into multiple deployable units, which you could consider as microservices. Um, but I can't really go beyond that because there are lots of definitions out there. And uh, for me, it's, it's usually not that important. I just, I don't see the benefit of trying to explain that one unless, unless I come to a company and there's been some misinformation, like someone insists that a microservice must be a bounded context and a microservice must be a hundred lines of code. Then I'll explain to them, well, you've got two invariants there, but you can't have both of them. You can have one or the other. I, I think I, I, I treat, treat it the same way. I look at bounded context as a more looser uh, logical boundary. And I look at microservices more as like a, a physical deployable uh, unit that, that does some autonomous function uh, that's part of that context. So I could, um, I could have like two or three or four services inside that bounded context accomplishing the goal of what it's supposed to do. So I've, I've thought about it that way as well. Uh, yeah, I think so. Um, oh, sorry, had you finished or? Yeah, yes. Okay, so I, I think there's a couple of things also to consider in this space. Sometimes, so if we think about a system and we have a hundred bounded contexts, some of those bounded contexts will be more coupled to others. We might find clusters of bounded contexts. So we need a higher level concept. I call that a super context which is a context composed of other contexts. If you read the Uber um, blog post from a, a month or so ago, Uber, you know, they had hundreds of microservices. They needed, needed a way to organize groups or clusters of them. And they call that a domain. A group of microservices belongs to a domain. And actually the domain itself has a public interface and you can't go directly to another microservice not inside your domain. So I think as an industry, we just, we don't have good names for these different levels of abstraction. I think there's a lot of good coming out of the microservices community. So I, I'm not saying ignore them or their contributions aren't useful. All I'm saying is when it comes to defining what these things mean, there are lots of contradictions out there and it can be a bit of a minefield. Bounded context versus domain, is, is there a differentiation? Uh, seems we are using it interchangeably. Well, I, I think if you look at the definition of those words, they can mean the same things or they can mean different things. A domain is a subset of the world. That definition. We're just trying to work out what do these things mean? Right. Yeah. And, and it starts to get difficult when different people start to use different words for the same thing. And then as an industry, we have three words that mean the same thing and, and yeah, causes confusion, uh, definitely. Um, there's a question from Mike. Uh, he said, uh, Nick, uh, I know you showed some interest relatively recently in BPMN. When would you recommend using a BPMN? So I'm actually super excited about BPMN, but maybe not for the reasons some people think of BPMN for. So I worked in the government project once about five years ago, 
and the consultants had sold their BPMN solution as you don't need developers because the, the domain experts can use the BPMN tool to create all their business processes. And even the CTO was agreeing with them. CTO was like, yeah, the developers are slow. We don't need them. We can just use the BPMN tool. And then I said, so how do you test it? And the consultant went, you just write some JUnit tests. And I went, who's you? Because we've got no developers to write them. And so when the marketing takes over and BPMN is pitched as replace all your developers, I have no interest in that side of BPMN. I think it's useful in the niche area, but it's not a replacement for programming languages in general. Now, what does excite me about BPMN is the new, the new types I'm seeing. So before lockdown kicked off, um, at Domain Driven Design London, we had Ben Rooker, who's building a BPMN system called Commander. And what I saw from this is a way of designing your business processes that's not coupled to your code. So what happens is you design your business process in the BPMN tool, but then your code actually calls your BPMN system to notify the BPMN system once a certain business process step has happened. So what we're getting here is we're getting the benefits of choreography of not having to couple all of our process inside one code base, but we can still see the overall business process. So that, that interests me because one of the tenants or one of the ideas in microservices is we love choreography and we hate orchestration. Orchestration's become a bit of a dirty word. But the problem with choreography is that visualizing these end-to-end -end business processes becomes very difficult. And so that's why we, we need to find solutions that give us the benefits of choreography whilst also making the process visible. And I think, again, that goes back to my point about the contextual tool. If I can point something at a code base and it can extract the commands, queries, and events and the order they happen and the context they flow between, I can, I can see how the system works because that's what I'm looking for, right? I want to know how the system works. And if the rules are scattered everywhere, it's hard to piece that information together. And I can't see bad design choices. Like we can make the stupidest design choices, but if we don't visualize the information together, we, we can't realize the mistakes we're making. So that's why I think BPMN could be a stepping stone or a parallel journey to making systems more visible without making them too coupled and without this crazy, you don't need developers thing. Absolutely. Um, one last question. Would you say um, that the bounded context canvas is a good output of an event storming session? Would you, would you treat it that way? Um, would you do it up, yeah, as an artifact of event storming before, after? Yeah, so I think it's something you can start working on in your event storming sessions or after your sessions. That's the, that's the process I teach in my workshop, event storming and start creating the canvas. Obviously, I was talking earlier about message flows. I think that's important too. But there's nothing stopping you from creating an event storm, identifying those bounded contexts, creating a canvas, and then doing your message flows later. Yeah, actually, in my workshop today, we got to the message flows, and people were saying, it's kind of hard to work out which messages go from this context to this context, because we haven't properly defined what it is yet. So. This is the challenge of design. It's which bits do we do first in which order? And that's why the process I showed you earlier is a useful starting point, but in reality, design is much more fuzzy, iterative, complex, and just about knowing what to do at the right time. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you, Nick. Um, thank you so much for sharing, like, like I don't know, so, so much of great, awesome information. And, and taking your time on, on your evening, especially after your workshop. Um, this is super awesome. Um, for those of you on this call, I'm planning to have the next meetup sometime uh, mid or end of October. I'm, I've asked uh, Suzanne Kaiser uh, to speak um, uh, as well. So we'll figure out a, 
uh, date and time and I will um, create it on the event calendar and uh, hopefully I won't change it as many times as I did with this one. I apologize. But uh, thank you. Thank you again, Nick. Uh, and no uh, have, thank you as well. Yeah, have, have a wonderful evening. Thanks. Bye. Bye.